Здравствуйте, уважаемые телезрители. В эфире очередной выпуск программы «Акцент». Я ее ведущий Юрий Алаев. Но выпуск у нас сегодня не совсем обычный, точнее, совсем необычный. Мы пригласили в студию лауреата премии Немилобачевского 2017 года. 1 декабря ему вручили премию и медаль. Это профессор Калифорнийского университета США Ричард Шен и э, кинорежиссера, лауреата ряда международных фестивалей документального кино Екатерину Еременко, которая как раз в эти дни снимает по заказу КФУ фильм о Лобачевском и о нашем университете. И, кстати сказать, Екатерина Еременко по базовому образованию математик. Учитывая это обстоятельство, мы решили, что это как раз тот случай, когда лучше, чтобы... Эти два человека поговорили о математике, о будущем геометрии, о новых открытиях, которые нам суждены, между собой. А я вместе с вами просто послушаю. Профессор Шон, спасибо вам большое за ваше время и что вы пришли сюда в этой студии сегодня утром. Я читал, что это был ваш первый раз в России. Если это был какой-то для вас, вы нашли что-то в Казани, что вы ожидали, или что-то для вас 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 для I was also surprised at the colors of the buildings. The, the, we walked to the, uh, 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 last night to see the mosque at the, uh, uh, at the Kremlin, and it was so beautiful at night. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I guess th th those are the, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but uh, it surprised me a little that, it's, uh, that it looks so prosperous. Um, you, congratulations with wonderful awards with uh, Lobachevsky Prize. Uh, how is uh, known Lobachevsky in the United States among normal people, among mathematicians, and who are other Russian mathematicians are well known in America? Um, I would say that um, Lobachevsky would be known to almost every mathematician in the United States. Uh, he is often mentioned in high school geometry courses. Uh, when, when Euclidean geometry is done, uh, the teacher might say that, that uh, uh, the parallel postulate can be removed and, and there are other geometries that are possible, in, in which case Lobachevsky's name would, uh, would be mentioned. But I wouldn't say that he would be widely known uh, outside of mathematical circles in the United States. Um, uh, other But he, on the other hand, he may be among the best-known Russian mathematicians uh, among people in the United States. Actually, to tell you the truth, there are not many American mathematicians that a typical American would, would have heard of either. Um, there are some physicists who've gotten a lot of publicity, like Einstein and people like that. Um, but, um, but no, I think Lobachevsky is probably the most, would probably be the most well-known Russian mathematician in the United States. Thank you very much. And which other Russian mathematician names you could tell us? Which are kind of uh, who would be known in the United States? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. um, well, um, uh, I think Kolmogorov is very, would be very well known in, in mathematical uh, uh, circles, for sure. Um, and of course, the, uh, in geometric circles, names like Novikov and uh, um, Uh, Gromov was uh, very well known in mathematical circles, but I, I don't think people outside of mathematics would know, mm -hmm. would know the people. Another very well known mathematician who, who vis has visited the U.S. a few times is Arnold, and he is very well known in engineering circles as well as mm -hmm. mathematics, but probably again not outside the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, not to the general public. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Science don't have any national borders, but still there is some national tradition. Uh, we know that French traditional mathematics with Bourbaki style have a um, style with uh, very strong axiomatic method. In other part of mathematics, some people even declare that mathematics is almost experimental science, should be very, very connected to natural science. Which school you belong? Could you speak a little bit about this? I, I would put myself somewhere in between those two. Um, Uh, I think parts of the Bourbaki style were maybe a little too formal, in, at least in, 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 ge in geometry. Um, so I have a, 
Uh, my mathematics is rigorous, so I, I make sure that the, uh, the theorems are rigorous, so it's not purely experimental. Um, but it's also uh, not necessarily formulated in the most general axiomatic way. Uh, I'm more interested in getting to the interesting results, uh, even if it involves maybe ignoring some generalization that, that, that could be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is important ap application of your science and exactly to your results, if it's found already some application? Could you speak about this a bit? Well, um, the positive mass theorem is, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a general statement about the Einstein equation, so it doesn't, uh, I, I guess it, it, it's more of a, a test of the consistency of, of uh, the mathematical theory of relativity. I, I, I don't think it has concrete applications uh, as it stands. Um, so probably none of my work it would be directly directly applied. But I, I have worked on um, uh, new physical phenomena. So uh, things like understanding um, uh, the, um, the the way that soap films uh, uh, bend and things of that sort, some very concrete uh, uh, estimates on the behavior of, 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 uh, of soap films. And so, although it's real world mathematics is not directly aimed at applications, uh, it's more, so my goal is to uh, understand the geometric phenom phenom phenomena in a, um, in a rigorous mathematical way. And often geometry is very close to physics and the real world, and so, <clears throat> and so I, I very much like the connection between the uh, pure mathematics and the, uh, and the physical problems. Mm -hmm. um, in the film which we were showing uh, today on the prize ceremony, I was mentioning some results from discrete differential geometry. You're working in differential geometry. And discrete differential geometry, it's a very, very fast mm -hmm. developing field now, mm -hmm. especially uh, two-dimensional. So it's very developed because it's have lots of application in computer science. Uh, how you see perspective of um, uh, developing of three dimension uh, discrete dif differential geometry? How it's how you see perspective of applying your theory to three, dim three dimensional or more dimensional science? Speak about discretization. Well, I think I think if you wanted to uh, numerically solve the Einstein equations, you have to discretize in a smart way. And I think one of the hard things about discretizing uh, two-dimensional surfaces uh, is is to do it in a in a way that that actually reflects the geometric properties of the surface, rather than to just take some very rough uh, grid on the uh, on the surface. So I, I think it's a uh, it's a very difficult subject, and um, I, I think that to do that you have to f first know the uh, the, uh, the the theoretical side of it. And there was the continuum theory, and then you also have to be able to uh, to uh, understand the computational part, it's how to how to uh, how to construct grids on curved surfaces, which is a very non-trivial subject in itself. So, in some sense, discrete differential geometry is more difficult than than uh, than than continuous differential geometry mm -hmm. or smooth differential geometry. Mm -hmm. What, what I heard that uh, theory of surfaces is pretty much, much developed. That's very lots of fundamental results in this field. But as I understand, three-dimensional theory it's very very poor developed in the moment. And uh, three-dimensional um, Riemannian geometry, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it it's uh, well on the discrete side. You're mm -hmm. probably right. Um, uh, th there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, um, theory for. Uh, Three and higher dimensional Riemannian geometry, which is fairly well developed. There's still a lot. There's still a lot of questions that can't be solved as well. So, so I think that the three dimensional theory in the smooth for smooth geometry is under in, in better shape than uh, than the higher dimensional theory. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in particular, the results involving Ricci flow give a lot of information about three dimensional geometry, which was not accessible before. Whereas in higher dimensions, so far those methods don't say very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in Russia in modern time, the most famous among 
normal audience mathematician is Grisha Perelman because of a reason he just wants to be away from the media by this way somehow come to the very much center of the attention of <laughs> and this way of course problem of Poincaré is the most famous problem among, among Russian people mm. and I've heard that your theory is somehow connected with Poincaré problem and it used to be options to prove Poincaré problem using your theory could you speak a little bit about this using my theory yes yes uh, your, your theory of the field where you're working it was some some people was working on this hoping uh, to prove uh, Poincaré problem. Could you a little bit tell me uh, about this? Or maybe mathematician? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, um, uh, the uh, proving the Poincaré conjecture um, can be viewed in a purely geometric way. Um, namely, if you take a, a, a simply connected three-dimensional manifold, <clears throat> so simply connected just means that every curve can be contracted continuously to a point then the Poincaré conjecture says that such a manifold is, is, um, is, is really the three sphere. It's diffeomorphic to, uh, to uh, S3. And so um, uh, one way of trying to prove it is to show that there's a nice geometry on the, on, on the uh, simply connected three manifold. In particular, if you can, if you can construct a constant curvature geometry, uh, then, then it's easy to show that it's, uh, it's the standard sphere. And so, and so uh, the problem of constructing um, and so in three dimensions, constant curvature is the same as Einstein. Uh, it's the same as constant Ricci curvature, which, uh, uh, which is called Einstein. And um, there are different approaches to, to solving the Einstein equations on manifolds. The Ricci flow is one approach. It, it, um, the idea there is to start with any, any metric or any geometry and evolve it in, an, in a natural way so that it so that the metric improves and uh, ultimately converges to a steady state. The steady state solutions of the Ricci flow are exactly the Einstein metrics. But there's another approach too, which is uh, more from the, uh, say more motivated by uh, general relativity, and, and that is uh, there's a natural um, uh, variational energy. It's, it's called the Einstein-Hilbert uh, energy. The, it's, it's, it's just the total scalar curvature. And the critical points of that um, that uh, energy among um, variations, critical points among metrics with a fixed volume, say, are also the Einstein metrics. And so um, uh, I have worked somewhat on trying to understand the critical points. In fact, the Yamabe conjecture is the problem of understanding the critical points of that, but not among all metrics, but among metrics in a given conformal class, so a restricted class of metrics. And so, and so, um, my, uh, the original hope of Yamabe, which was the person who formulated the conjecture, was that you could solve the Poincaré conjecture by constructing critical points for that, for that functional. And so far, that has not been successful uh, uh, overall, whereas the Ricci flow has been successful. And so, uh, but, but both of them are quite natural approaches to the problem. So in that sense, my work is directed at, at, at uh, things like the Poincaré conjecture. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, what is the, another big problem staying in your field now? I've heard about a hypothesis of Wilmer, which was solved, I think, like four years ago in two-dimensional case. How you see perspective of solving three-dimensional case or even any some other big... Well, I, I don't think the Wilmer uh, conjecture has a natural analog in higher dimensions. It's really a two-dimensional problem. The energy is conformally invariant in the two-dimensional case. And I think the higher, uh, you can write down energies that are conformally invariant in higher dimensions, but I, I don't think the theory will be as, uh, as natural. The, a natural extension of the Wilmore problem would be to do it for uh, higher genus surfaces. So the, the Wilmore mm -hmm. question, the Wilmore problem sh uh, is, it mm -hmm. shows that the, um, uh, the Clifford torus, which is a very special uh, mm -hmm. torus in, uh, in R3 or in S3, is, uh, uh, is the unique minimizer of the Wilmore energy among all tori. Mm -hmm. And so you could ask a similar question for, um, uh, for, for a surface with two handles, a genus two surface mm -hmm. or genus three. And there are some conjectures about what the result should be, but, but so far that's not been, uh, that has not been resolved. Mm -hmm. And so that would be one, one direction to go in extending the Wilmore mm -hmm. problem. How you see the, your field, what is the biggest problem staying in your field at the moment where you're working? 
Uh, well, it depends on what, what my what my field is defined to be. <laughs> but but uh, in terms of um, in terms of Riemannian geometry, um, uh, I think uh, the Hopf conjectures are very important problems. So so the four dimensional case. So so Ricci flow completely classifies three dimensional manifolds of of uh, positive curvature. Uh, it shows that they're precisely the the uh, manifolds that have constant curvature metric. They're called spherical space forms. Uh, in four dimensions, uh, that's no longer true because uh, th there's another four dimensional manifold of positive curvature, which is the complex projective plane. And so um, the, um, the conjecture in four dimensions is that, is that the manifolds of positive uh, sectional curvature are, are uh, just the the four sphere and its quotients and the complex projective projective plane, and so and that's a conjecture. It's, it's related to uh, conjectures of Heinz Hopf, uh, who, uh, by the way, was also a winner of the Lobachevsky Prize years ago. And um, that conjecture, I think, is very very interesting and still very much unsolved. So, for example, Hopf just posed the question of whether uh, S two cross S two could carry a metric with positive curvature, and so far we don't know the answer to that. So I think that's a very uh, interesting question in four-dimensional Riemannian geometry. Uh, and I would very much like to solve it, but I don't know how to do it. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am working in the films uh, field now. I am making mathematical films. What do you think about um, how it's important to make popularization of mathematics, how it should be done, and which films with mathematics you have seen and which you like? What do you think about Which it? mathematical films? Um, I haven't seen very many. I, I miss the um, the Ramanujan film, mm -hmm. uh, actually. Let's see. I saw um, what was the uh, yeah this is the mathematical documentaries. I, I I saw TV documentaries about Fermat's Last Theorem. BBC with Andrew Wiles. Yeah, that was that was uh, of course a very interesting story. Um, I I think the I, I think I think making documentary films about mathematics is a very important thing to do because I think more people should understand what mathematicians are doing. I, I've often tried to explain it to people and, and it works to some extent, but, but it, it's sort of explained metaphorically. I mean, it's hard to get across even a small bit of what's really going on or what, what the real issues are in the problems. And so, and so I, I think it's very challenging for a documentary filmmaker to, to actually get across the ideas of hyperbolic geometry, for example, mm -hmm. which which uh, I saw part of your film yesterday, and so uh, so I think it's very worthwhile, and um, uh, and I would definitely like to see more uh, mm -hmm. more of it. I want to use this opportunity to present your film I did about the disc it's called the discrete charm of geometry, and this oh, okay. is the commentary discrete I produced. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. about the work of a group of people working in modern dis discrete differential geometry. Mm -hmm. and okay. Yeah. If you will see this, maybe you can write me a few words. I will be curious. Okay. What I'm reading, actually, I'm reading math theorem here. This is oh, math, okay. math thing beside this. It's really incident theorem here. Oh, OK. I see. So, and mm -hmm. this is pictures Pretty from the work, fr from very modern mathematical works. So it's really staying mathematics beside this. Uh -huh. OK, yeah. So mm -hmm. this is incident theorem. About so it's related to <laughs> it's, uh, uh, billiards. Uh, no, uh, no, it's, it's it looks not? like billiards. But this theorem, when if you have a mesh, and if you would put it every, it's like checkerboards. If you put circles, when there is theorem, we, we could, should touch the ellipsoid, mm. the ellipse, mm -hmm. okay. quadrix. And it's like really pictures from the yeah, remote mathematical okay. world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How you became a mathematician? Do you, what is your very early memory you think about mathematics? Um, well, I, I think I was attracted to mathematics uh, because I liked being able to uh, actually start with some hypotheses and prove a theorem which is very non-trivial from those hypotheses. Um, and, and to, I, I like the rigor, uh, the mathematical rigor. So I think plane geometry was the first uh, uh, course that I took as a student which attracted me to the, uh, to the area. Um, although I don't really use a purely axiomatic approach, generally I think in the beginning I, I think that idea, the, the idea of um, uh, rigorously developing uh, an advanced set of uh, topics attracted me a lot to the uh, mm -hmm. to the subject. I was also eventually attracted to the physical side. You know, the uh, I liked physics also uh, when I was in high school and college, and so um, and so I, I, I like the um, uh, I like the connections between uh, uh, mathematics and physics. Mm -hmm. And what was your very first memory 
as a child, your meeting with mathematics? My first meetings with mathematics, well, when I was in elementary school, mathematics was just uh, uh, long division, <laughs> arithmetic. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so at that point, I wasn't you know, too excited about it, but I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was when I was about 13 that I, I, I had a brother who was in college at that time, and he was a mathematics major. And so he brought me uh, some high school books from college, and I found those really interesting. Uh, and so it was really learning more about uh, uh, this kind of uh, logical, theoretical side of it that attracted me to it, more, more, than, more than the number side. I mean, mm -hmm. But of course, being able to compute is also very important mm -hmm. in mathematics. Uh, Lobachevsky was working in Kazan, and this time it was a center very far away from another mathematical center. How it is possible now in our day to work in isolation? How, what, if it's to, work in a, to, to work in a place which is far away from which another is far mathematical. Away. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's much easier now than it was then because mm -hmm. of uh, the, all of the uh, information which is available on, mm -hmm. on the internet. I think almost anywhere in the world uh, you would be able to access the internet. So, so um, um, I, I think it is possible now to, for a very talented person to learn a lot of mathematics and possibly do new research without actually being in one of the centers. And so, in a way, it's a good thing, but it, it doesn't seem to happen very often. Uh, I don't see a lot of work done by people who are very isolated, uh, which uh, is developing really new mathematics. But ma maybe Perlman was a little bit like that, because he, he spent some time in the United States in a couple of years in the middle 90s, and then he came back to, uh, to Russia, and he worked by himself for seven years, mm -hmm. uh, Perlman. Uh, mm -hmm. on the Ricci flow and, and, mm -hmm. and then um, came out in about 2002 with uh, s such remarkable papers on it. Mm -hmm. On the last Congress in Seoul, in, in, in the National Congress of Mathematics, it was uh, a Chinese scientist who solved this in number theory problem, which was a big surprise for everyone. He was working in the... Oh, yes. That, the that's an interesting story, too. Yeah. Was uh, amazing story. Zhang. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he worked on that problem for so many years and uh, couldn't find a job and and was working in a very small university with a high teaching load in the United States. In, in uh, and then solved this, uh, this major mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, no, that's a great, those are wonderful stories. Great example. And, but they're fairly rare still, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lobachevsky work was not uh, accepted in, in, among math society in his time. And it's your other uh, examples like Cantor, people even such great genius people like Poincaré or Hilpert, they didn't accept what they were doing. Do you think it's any, any, any field in our days which is also somehow don't get recognition but still have chance to be very important in the future? What, how you see the perspective in modern mathematics on this? Um. Some fields which are well, not so popular. Well, it, it depends what you mean by not accepted. Uh, ah. I mean, th maybe there, there are some fields that are underrated in, in the sense that uh, they actually contain important ideas which will be used to, mm -hmm. to uh, have a broad influence in, in other areas that, and people don't, uh, don't realize that, mm -hmm. that that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of being not accepted as being correct or not, I, I think, I, think uh, I, I, I doubt that there are fields like that because I think you know, if if someone proposes a set of ideas and and writes down a proof which is not rigorous, then I, I think people would say that well, what you're doing mm -hmm. is not really correct. And so, mm -hmm. there are many more mathematicians now than there were mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. And which so, uh, mm -hmm. so I I think it's a little different than it was. Mm -hmm. in, in but which which field is un underrated? <laughs> <laughs> you are the vice president I, of American Math Society. I, I, I'm just speculating. I'm <laughs> no, I'm asking you also because as <laughs> vice president of American Math Society, you might have some <laughs> overview. Well, um, I guess if I knew which field were underrated, I would start working in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't really have an example, but but fields become more or less pop, uh, popular through time and and. One of the ways that a field becomes popular is uh, if, it, um, if, if theorems are proven which have um, uh, influence outside the field. I, I, I think the broader the, the audience, uh, the, more, the more popular uh, a field will be. Uh, and so there are probably some very deep works that are done that are not widely appreciated because there are not so many people working in the field. And mm -hmm. so even mathematics has fashion and uh, the fashions mm -hmm. do change over time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to say which, uh, predict which, uh, which fields will become fashionable mm -hmm. in the future.
But this year was very successful for you. You got four prizes, which is absolutely amazing. What has happened? Could you explain us? Well, I, I really don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I, I think it was probably just chance. I, I, I was as surprised as, as anybody. And I got four really wonderful prizes. So it's, uh, yeah, it was quite a, uh, quite gratifying. It didn't have any prizes before. Life. It didn't have any any prize before, so it is. <laughs> well, I, I I actually I won some prizes in the United States before, but I, I had I hadn't actually ever won an international prize before. I think that's true. Yeah. Any explanation? <laughs> well, um, when you feel I, I don't really have one. I mean, I, I think. Um, I think my work has been widely known for a long time, and um, uh, I certainly have been a highly recognized mathematician, and I have never felt that I was badly treated or underrated mm -hmm. in any way. But, but um, I think maybe people, uh, you know, as, as, as you get older, there are certain prizes that are career prizes, so I think people look at, uh, at what, what you've done in your career, and, um, and um, I think I happen to be nominated for, for some, and then they they, uh, it just happened that this year, mm -hmm. several of them, mm -hmm. Maybe several of them worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure that your field now became more fashionable also. With My field, prizes, be absolutely. because of the prizes? Yes. Mm -hmm. It should um, be. It might, I, I don't know. I think it takes time for, mm -hmm. uh, for fields, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, works to be, to mm -hmm. filter down to the student level. Mm -hmm. I remember when Fermat's last theorem was done, I expected there would be a big rush of graduate students into, mm -hmm. into number theory because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't for for several years, but I think now number theory has become a more uh, uh, a more popular subject, probably partly because of the of things like Fermat's last theorem. Mm -hmm. So I think it there's some lag of time lag between uh, sort of public recognition and uh, and. Um, uh, the effect on graduate students or young researchers. Mm -hmm. One question which I always ask mathematicians, I could not get really answer. Lobachevsky was working very hard on the field, making lots of calculation, without, seems like without having models. How it's possible? How you think about mathematics? Would it, would it be possible for you to work so long without having geometrical models? How you see mathematics? It's, if it's important for you to imagine some object? Well, I, I think it's probably a lot easier to do hyperbolic geometry if you have a model, uh, a simple model to work with. On the other hand, I think it, it is possible, and, and apparently Lobachevsky did it, to, to actually uh, do calculations without having the, the model. And I think you, you probably have to work a lot harder uh, to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, so for me, I, I, I look for the easiest ways. If I'm doing a calculation, I, I, I look for the easiest ways to do that. And uh, uh, if there's some simple set of coordinates or some, some model that I can use, I would definitely use that rather than just working directly from the axioms. Mm -hmm. uh, Vladimir Arnold, whom you mentioned, uh, he was, I was a student that was visiting some of his lectures, and he told that very often it's very, very important to read sources because very often uh, late interpreter, they lose lots of sense. It's very important to uh, read the sources. Uh, this uh, is not a rush villain. You said, or so that, uh, it's very important to read original sources of yeah. scientists because later uh, in interpreters oh, who, okay. who who would just kind of um, adopt this work for e easier understanding, often they would lose some very important results. Okay, and so do you think it's so possible to apply to the Bachevsky work? So just to clarify, you said not a rush villain, right? Sorry, I say Arnold, Vladimir Arnold, Vladimir Arnold. Oh, Arnold. Arnold, okay, Arnold, Arnold said that, he yeah, okay. Because I was going to say, I, I would be surprised if not originally no, no. said that. Arnold, he, Vladimir Arnold. he gave an example oh, yeah. of Newton. Yeah. He told yeah. lots yeah. of Ar results Ar of Newton. Arnold uh, was very interested in old, uh, old sources, yeah. Well, he may be right. I mean, it's, it's quite possible that there are things discovered in mathematics that are forgotten. Um, you know, uh, Newton was obviously a great mathematician, and there may well be uh, work in the Principia, which was never really followed up, and I, I think Arnold was was saying that there's a lot in Newton that we we still don't understand, and so um, so yeah, I, I think I think he's right on that, and that could also be true of Lobachevsky because I, I don't know very many people who have read the original uh, Lobachevsky works. In fact, I think they were very slow to be published. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I have time for one okay. more question. Uh, if you would have chance to meet Lobachevsky, what you what you would ask him? I would ask him how he did his calculations. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you also one more question, just in case of the, for normal people. Uh, in my film also some, someone mentioned Lobachevsky was out of the normal world. 
And there is image of mathematician who are a little bit strange people mm -hmm. because you should be very much concentrated. How you manage your work of mathematics of normal life if it's your family suffering or your friends suffering from your work? <laughs> this is my last question. <laughs> well, um, I think it is true that mathematics draws you into a world which is very much your own in that, in that you can't really say what you're doing. And so from that, it, it, in that way, it can be kind of antisocial if you're involved in, in proving a really hard theorem because you have to spend many, many hours uh, uh, you know, in hard thought about that. Um, I find that um, I, I seem to be able to, well, so first of all, my family provides, brings me down to earth and provides a, uh, a, uh, a grounding for me. Uh, for sure, and also just social contacts. I find teaching to be, uh, the students also make you think about very practical things. And so, so I, I think it really is important to keep a balance. And I, I'm not sure if I would do very well if I had a pure research job where I didn't uh, do anything except mm -hmm. sit and do my own work. I think I would look for collaborators and uh, uh, you know, some social contacts as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, but there are other mathematicians who really just want to work by themselves. And so, and it can make you a little bit uh, socially strange, I think, if you do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for okay. your time. Thank you very much okay. for a very honest answer for our talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Это была программа «Акцент» с лауреатом премии имени Лобачевского 2017 года профессором Калифорнийского университета Ричардом Шейном и кинорежиссером, математиком по базовому образованию Екатериной Ребенко. Спасибо вам за внимание. До новых встреч.